being members. No real experiment could prepare theta with an arbitrary value in that set or measure precisely what it was. What we could really measure is something like the angle between the rods rounded down to the nearest degree at time t. Let's call that observable phi hat. Its spectrum is a discrete set, not a continuum. It's the integers from 10 to 170 equals many quantum observables have discrete spectra from the outset they're not approximations to anything continuous at all that's what gave quantum theory its name quantum means discrete chunk notice that a physical system has to be envisaged as having two contrasting properties on the one hand, it can undergo motion, including being experimented on and measured. It can undergo changes over time. But on the other hand, for the very idea of a physical system that changes to make sense, it must retain its identity over time, which means that it has some characteristics that remain invariant and identifiable throughout any possible change. Um, this angle can change with time, but the fact that the system has an angle observable, that it's defined in a certain way in terms of these rods, is an invariant feature of the system. If this were disassembled into components, it might still be possible to define theta and to measure it, but ultimately, if the object were melted down, say, it could become physically impossible to identify which atom was which, and then theta would definitely no longer exist, and nor would this physical system. To some extent, it's arbitrary where we draw the line between a physical system having merely changed its configuration and having ceased to exist. But what's important is that in quantum physics, it's always possible to analyze phenomena in terms of physical systems, that undergo changes and interactions with other systems, but nevertheless retain their identity over time because some things about them remain invariant. In particular, what observables they have, how they can be measured, and what their spectra are. What else is invariant? Well, the system's laws of motion. Its actual motion can be different on different occasions, but the laws that determine how the system behaves in isolation or how it would behave under any given external circumstances, these two are invariant features of a physical system. Let me call that which is invariant about a physical system its constitution. Its static constitution is all its invariant characteristics apart from laws of motion. And its dynamics are its laws of motion. To complete the description of a quantum physical system, we need to specify a third thing, namely its state, what it's actually doing during a particular experiment in all the universes in which it exists. In classical physics, the analog of specifying the state would be specifying which trajectory the system is on. So, in the quantum case, the state specifies which of its trajectories in the multiverse the whole multiversal object is on. In this sense of the word state, the state of a system doesn't change. Quantum observables change under the laws of motion, but the state is timeless. This sort of state is known as the Heisenberg state of the system. I'm just telling you that in case you come across an alternative way of specifying what a quantum system is doing, called the Schrodinger state, which does change with time. I'll be using the Schrodinger state a lot in later lectures, but for the moment, by state, I mean the constant Heisenberg state. 
In a moment, I'll tell you how we specify all three things, the static constitution of a system, its laws of motion, and its Heisenberg state. But first, some more about observables. We can express the relationship that I defined between the observables theta and phi like this. Phi hat equals floor of theta hat. Now, floor is the function that takes any real number to the nearest integer less than or equal to it. Since this function is initially defined for real numbers, we have to be careful about what we mean by applying it to an observable. This brings us to our first encounter with the algebra of observables. Given any observable, say x, and any function f that's defined for every element in the spectrum of x, let's say x1, x2, up to xn, quantum theory says that there exists another observable, f of x, whose spectrum consists of elements which are f of elements in the spectrum of x. up to f of xn. For example, we can multiply x by a real number, say lambda, and get another observable, lambda x, whose spectrum consists of lambda times elements in the spectrum of x. OK, this is the spectrum of f of x. But what is f of x physically? Well, given a way of measuring x, there are guaranteed to be at least two ways of measuring f of x. One way is to measure x and then to compute the function f of the outcome of that measurement. That whole operation of measuring x and then performing that computation constitutes a measurement of the observable f of x. Another way of measuring the observable f of x would be to relabel the measuring instrument that's used to measure x. For example, if we took this protractor and relabeled it so that where it now says 10, 20, 30, and so on, we would write 20, 40, 60, and so on, then the act of lining up that protractor with these rods and reading off the number on that scale would constitute measuring the observable 2 phi instead of phi. In general, there are also other ways of measuring the observable f of x that don't involve x at all. For instance, my measurement of phi here certainly does not involve first measuring theta and then rounding the outcome to the nearest integer. Nor does it involve recalibrating an instrument that measures theta. My whole reason for introducing phi was that there just isn't an instrument that's capable of literally measuring theta. Now, let g be the function that maps any real number to a constant, say 1. Consider the observable g of x. Its spectrum just contains a single element, spectrum of equals the set containing just 1. And therefore, to measure g of x, you don't even have to do an experiment. All you have to do is write down the outcome was 1. We call this trivial observable the unit observable, 1 hat. 
spectrum of one hat equals the set containing one. Similarly, lambda times the unit observable, where lambda is any real number, must be another trivial observable, the one where the only possible outcome of measuring it is lambda. I said that the spectrum of an observable is part of the system's invariant identity. We can express this invariance in an algebraic way. Let the values in the spectrum of some observable x of t be x1, x2, and so on, up to xn. These values don't change with time. Consider this function. P maps x to x minus x1 times x minus x2 times and so on up to x minus xn. This is a polynomial. It'll have an expansion like this. P of x equals a0 plus a1x plus and so on up to a n x to the n. The degree n of the polynomial is the same as the number of elements in the spectrum of x. Now, since p is a function that's defined for all elements of the spectrum of x, in fact it's defined for all real numbers, p of x of t must be an observable. And it's easy to find out what observable it is if we first work out its spectrum. The elements of the spectrum are p of x1 and p of x2 and so on up to p of xn. And those values are all zero because whenever little x is in the spectrum, there's a term in this product that's zero. So the spectrum of P of X of T only contains one element, namely zero. Measure it, and you'll always get the outcome zero. And therefore, P of X of T itself must be 0 times the unit observable, which we also write just 0. So, although the observable x itself changes with time, we found an algebraic equation that it satisfies at all times. Let me write it down explicitly. A0 1 plus A1 x of t plus plus a n x of t to the n equals zero. Therefore, this algebraic statement about x of t is a statement about the static constitution of the quantum system that x belongs to. And here's a general truth about quantum systems. Every algebraic relation among observables at one time is true of the same observables at every other time, too. And so is part of the static constitution of the system. In fact, the set of all true algebraic relations among observables at any one time defines the static constitution of the system. So, suppose you found an algebraic equation that related some of the observables of the system at time t. Say, um, f of a of t, b of t, so on, equals zero. 
then 